give me the thumbs up. Okay, good evening everybody. Welcome to our virtual council meeting for Monday, February the 8th. I will call this meeting to order and I will go through a roll call. Just please say here uh, when I call your name. Councilor Bruno. <laughs> Councilor Bodner. Here. Councilor Wells. Here. Councilor Demaray. Here. Councilor Clayla. Here. Councilor Bagu. Here. Councilor Danch. Here. Thank you, Council, and Councilor Beauregard uh, will not be here this evening. At this time, uh, can we ask that we play our national anthem? Very good. Again, we thank the McKay, McKay Choir and Band for that. Uh, there are no proclamations this evening, Council. And I'll have the adoption of the agenda moved by Councillors Bodner and Wells. Any questions with regards to the agenda? Seeing none, all in favor, please raise a hand. And that's carried. Any disclosures of interest this evening? Seeing none, thank you, Council. We have one set of minutes, a uh, regular meeting of council, January 25th, 2021. I'll have councillors Danch and Bruno move that. Any questions on those minutes? Seeing none, all in favor, please raise your hand. That's carried. Under staff reports, I have reports 7.1, 7.2, 7.4 being raised. Any other reports? Needed to be raised, Council? Seeing none, I'll have uh, Councillors Bagu and Kalaliff move the remaining item. All those in favor? Raise a hand. Okay. So item 7.3, the recommendation report regarding the communication tower at 534 Pleasant Beach Road has been carried. Correspondence items. We have items 8.1, 8.2, and 8.3 not being withdrawn, only 8.4. Any of those three items, does anybody want to bring up any of those three items that I mentioned? Seeing none, Councillor Demeray and Councillor Kalaliff, if I can have you move 8.1 to 8.3. All those in favor, please raise their hand. That's carried. We have one presentation this evening, Council. Matt Robinson, Director, and Scott Fraser, Transportation Lead, Go Implementation, Niagara Region, Niagara Transit Governance Study. This actually goes along with uh, Staff Report 7.1, which we will go into as soon as the uh, presentation is completed. And just bear with me. Bring up their presentation. 
Okay, do we have the two gentlemen in? Okay. Welcome, uh, Matt and Scott. Good evening. Good evening. So, uh, take it away. All right. Yeah. in principle to move forward with transit consolidation. Matt. Tonight, taking those next steps as we now look at the recommended governance model. Matt, can I just, yes, I'm just going to interrupt you for a second. We're just having an issue with your sound being carried through to our we stream. Can the council hear them? Councillors, can you hear his presentation okay? Bruno? Very good. Hear it loud and clear. Okay. Perfect. We're all set. Just give us a second, Matt. Sure, Thanks. No problem. Can you ask him to try again? Yep. Okay, you want to continue, Matt? Sure thing. So, as noted in your staff report, the LNTC should was start established again. after that oh. unanimous triple majority process. Matt, can I can I ask you for one more favor? Sure thing. <laughs> Come on. Only because we don't think it um, picked up. So, when the public's going to watch this online. Can we ask you to start over? <laughs> Sorry. Absolutely, sir. Thank you. Absolutely. I appreciate that. Let me get back here to slide one. Are we back to slide one? Yes. Councilor Bruno, I can see you. Can you give me a nod? We're on slide yeah. one? Yes, yes, you are. All right, perfect. Yep. Okay. All right. So, good evening, Mayor Steele and Council, and thank you for the opportunity to be here. My name is Matt Ross. First, wanted to recognize Mayor Steele and Regional Councilor Butters for their continued support of transit at Regional Council, and certainly your CAO, Scott Louie, for his continued work with the IMT Working Group as a member of that group uh, since its inception. Tonight, Council will hear about the next steps in the progression toward a consolidated transit system in Niagara. Tonight is about consultation. 
This is Council's chance to provide the project team and the MNTC with feedback on the governance model. The governance model is our focus in this next step. There are obviously still many details to be determined, including ongoing collaboration on financials and service. The LNTC is not asking Council to make any final decisions tonight. Tonight is about whether the governance model is the right one to continue to progress forward. This is not the triple majority vote. Your staff report part outlines areas of feedback, and this is exactly the type of feedback we're seeking at this stage. After the consultation period, next steps will be done in collaboration with our municipal partners under the leadership of the LNTC and the CAO working group. So tonight, we're going to examine where we've been and why we're here, the governance studies highlights, examine the benefits of a consolidated system, and then wrap up with a look at next steps. When we were last before Council in 2017, Triple Majority was sought for the region to operate transit. Included in that 2017 vote was an endorsement in principle to move forward with transit consolidation. Tonight is about taking those next steps as we now look at the recommended governance model. As noted in your staff report, the LNTC was established after that triple majority process. It was established to direct operational harmonization and develop a transit governance recommendation supported by the IMT working group. With LNTC supporting the commission model in principle, they're now requesting municipal input into the recommendations. So first a quick overview to orient us. Transit in Port Coburn today is multifaceted. NSTE specialized transit has been serving mobility challenged residents in Port Coburn for years, making trips to adjacent municipalities across Niagara. The NRT Port Link Group provides intermunicipal trips out of town to Welland uh, and uh, furthermore beyond that. This was first started by the city and uploaded fully to the region in January 2019. And the Port Coburn Community Bus provides local trips within the city of Port Coburn. So it's clear that Port Coburn residents are familiar with transit and have used it at a growing rate for quite some time. The next step is to look at what could be possible if the system were integrated. So why integrate? Your staff report outlines the economic and environmental benefits of a connected and seamless transit system, whether as a driver for a competitive business environment or enabling the city to thrive as a growing community, Port Coburn residents are embracing their transit options. An integrated transit system allows residents to connect more seamlessly, increasing social equity by breaking down mobility and economic barriers, making communities across Niagara connected in ways that improve on our residents' social determinants of health. Likewise, employers attest to the need for a connected and seamless system that enables their business and employees to access skills and opportunities both to and from the GTHA. It's no longer a competitive advantage to have integrated transit, it's a requirement. And lastly, integrated transit supports sustainability, contributes to a greener economy, enables a shift to greater transit use, and ultimately less vehicles on the road. So why do it now? Well, COVID-19 has had a dramatic impact on transit across the world. Most systems have ridership numbers that are a small fraction of the pre-pandemic numbers. The federal government indicates three to five years for transit to recover to their pre-pandemic levels. We've been working toward this goal since 2017. The IMT Working Group has achieved a long list of operational harmonization for a seamless transition to a single transit entity. And we appreciate the hard work of your CAO on that IMT Working Group on behalf of your community. Consolidating now allows us to maximize our resources at a time when resources are even more precious and transit is significantly reduced as a result of the pandemic. Overall, it would allow us to create a maximized system that fully leverages the resources we've collectively invested to make our transit system even better. Transition to a larger system ensures faster, more targeted investments are made in communities like Port Forward, where the connection with on-demand services in West Niagara are proving to be very effective and experiencing significant growth. And lastly, it allows for a seamless integration with the GO network, whether future integration Presto, new direct connections to new GO stations, or expansion of GO bus to new points like Brock University or Fort Erie. This is exponentially more effective under a single transit system. 
Over the course of 2020, under the guidance of the LNTC and the CAO Working Group, the consultants undertook developing a new governance model. The governance study used a five-step process that started with a full review of the current state of transit in Niagara. Who has what? How do they operate it? How much do they invest? They also did a full jurisdictional scan, peer regions from across Ontario, as well as Edmonton, Alberta, which together served as the baseline for their analysis. From there, the models were identified, compared, and graded against a number of factors landing on a final recommendation. With the recommended model, the study then plotted a blueprint for Niagara to transition effectively each step of the way to achieve this in a 24-month period. The study concluded that the full commission model was the most effective for Niagara, bringing the right balance of autonomy and flexibility to drive growth and transit innovation. The key benefits of the commission were its autonomy and financial flexibility. Through a commission, Niagara's transit system could grow with an exclusive focus on transit. The commission will be able to respond to trends in the industry and better adapt to pressures. The commission also stacks up as being the most cost-efficient system. This is well documented across Ontario with separate transit entities routinely providing a less expensive cost per trip than other transit models. The commission, or, or more legally referred to as a municipal services board, is recommended to have a nine-member board, five voting members from regional council, and four skills-based members of the public. Project team have noted in the Portfolio Report on your agenda tonight the desire for additional review of the board composition model in terms of representation. The composition before you is for feedback, and we certainly take note of the city's position. In support of the board, an advisory committee will be established with representatives from each community as well as from business and other local transit stakeholders. A five-step plan was developed to take the process from approval through to a fully in-service environment, including the selection of board, consolidation of staff, assets, and services, through to service launch. This process from start through to service transfer to the new entity is mapped out in significant detail in the study's transition plan, with the proposed opening day of the new commission being September 2022. So here in my hometown of Port Colborne, how does this benefit the residents in your community? The garden study highlights a number of positive impacts that a consolidated transit system will have on enhancing customer experience and driving system growth. It could remain difficult under the separate transit entities that are operating today. These include establishing a common fare structure and a single fare, fully implementing fare payment technology via smartphones, a single transit brand on all buses, a single number or website to visit for customer service, transfers to anywhere e easily, seamless connections and transfer to an expanded go network, expanded IMT routes from Port Colbert to Fort Erie, and establishing future connections to HSR in Hamilton. So what does this mean in terms of tangible? Well, NRT on demand is the biggest. The early ridership numbers are impressive. To be clear, because we've heard this in other communities, and I, I just want to sort of set this straight in our presentation uh, right at the outset, NRT on demand is not large buses traveling down streets empty in smaller municipalities. This is seven passenger vehicle transit at your residence fingertips, at the click of a button, at the end of your driveway, when you want it, and will only improve over time. Uh, although, admittedly, that's going to take more resources to do so as it grows in popularity. The connection right now with City Hall is currently bringing folks to and from West Niagara as a transfer point. Enhanced service is one of the key benefits to consolidation. I refer to this as transit equity. It creates service standards across municipalities. This means that both inter and intra municipal trips. NRT on demand service operating seven days a week. Under the proposed model, these service enhancements would be front loaded, so municipalities like Port Colbert realize service enhancements faster to benefit and drive tourism, economic development, and social equity. And lastly, with a single Niagara system, we can feed riders to our full rail stations, which will provide hourly go train service to and from the GTHA. A connected transit system is a necessity for go rail expansion, especially given the significant ridership Metrolinx projects 
of upwards of $1.8 million for the future Grimsby station, which they project to come from all over West and South Niagara. So to deliver on all these benefits requires a financial strategy. We've heard a lot of feedback on the proposed model, and we clearly understand more discussion or work in more detail needs to occur. The next phase of work will examine this feedback, explore options, and advance further detail and discussion with key municipal staff and decision makers. We appreciate the feedback contained in your report this evening. At present, the proposed financial model will see the move to a single regional levy, as the governance study recommends, based on the findings in other jurisdictions. This would mean municipal levies will no longer pay for transit by 2027. The upload duration varies by municipality. Smaller ones like Port Colburn upload from your local levy quickly, while larger ones like St. Catharines, for example, will be full five years from 2022 through 2027. And a governance study concludes that existing service levels be maintained for the first five years with aim for improvement based on new service standards. So the upload starts with funding transition costs via the regional levy. It ramps up as municipal transit municipal <coughs> budgets are transferred to the region. Throughout the upload, funding is being provided for expansion via the regional levy or reinvestment to the system from the uploads. With regard to assets, the CAO working group has endorsed the Cummings principle to address the future transfer of assets from one area municipality in the region to the new commission. Under this scenario, capital assets will be all transferred to the new commission. Although Port Colburn does not have transit assets to upload, it's important to understand how those who do will be treated. By utilizing the Cummings principle, asset transfers occur fairly, equitably, and transparently. And the principle has also been established through judicial precedent over the course of 40 years and has guided every other transit consolidation in Ontario. Under the single transit levy, the region would fund 100% of the new commission by 2027 as municipal costs are uploaded across Niagara. Specifically for Port Colborne, everything in your local budget that currently supports your local transit would be uploaded to the regional levy in 2023. The city would no longer contribute from its budget to transit this would reside entirely now on the regional levy, as noted in your staff report. With rising costs of a growing system, this provides significant benefit to the city and to the transit growth in your community. As the new commission is established and Niagara's transit system and ridership grow, there are a number of ways to mitigate future financial pressures on the regional levy and enable tax levy offsets, including support from our provincial and federal partners, population and assessment growth, and new business development, including associated development charges at the regional level. So in summary, the study concludes a full commission is the optimal governance model for Niagara. This is what LNTC is seeking support for in principle. Tonight is about consultation. As I said, this is not the triple majority vote. Your staff report lays out recommendations before council and areas the city wants to see additional work undertaken this is exactly what this phase is for. And lastly, this consultation period will have us, the project team, visiting all 13 councils through the end of February. We're now about halfway done with this roadshow. The LNTC has asked that we take the feedback, work collaboratively under the leadership of the CAO working group and other key municipal staff. It's only after this feedback is addressed and municipal interests are incorporated that the triple majority process would commence later in the summer of this year. If the process and timeline uh, are achieved by September 2022, Niagara could have a new single transit commission in place. So with that, Mr. Mayor, I pass it back to you. I thank council for their attention and we certainly welcome any questions that council may have. Great, Matt, thank you for the presentation. And just to put some context to this, both Councillor Bodner and I served on this committee many moons ago. And at that time, I had my three sons were 15, 12, and 7. Today, my three sons are 30, 27, and 22. There's the context of how long this has been going on. And I think it's time that the region uh, has one single uh, transit system. I mean, if you're going to be a big boy on the, 
on the playing field, then you've got to get your transit together. And if we're going to move people throughout Niagara and beyond, uh, we only need to uh, merge all this into one uh, system that hopefully, to be quite honest, can save the taxpayer in the long run. Now that GO uh, trains are coming into Niagara and there's further development, it just makes sense. You've got to move those people throughout Niagara. So uh, I just want to put a little context to that because <laughs> Ronnie and I certainly haven't gotten any younger doing this. Um, so again, Matt, thank you uh, to you and your team. I'm going to go to council with regards to questions on the presentation, and then I'll bring up the uh, staff report once we're there. So any questions on the presentation? Councilor Bruno. Thank you, Worship. Nice to see you back in your hometown, Matt. <laughs> um, Matt, one of the things, um, notwithstanding this is a vote and you've been quite succinct about it, about the one commission and not the upload and not the cost, I can't help but believe just from my ear to the ground that you'll have some other, and I believe it will be the smaller communities, um, whispering already about the costs. And, you know, that may bleed into this discussion, even though we're not there yet. I was wondering in your presentation, and I, I don't know where you're at with uh, moving around the region, but one of the things, although there's no magic bullet to growth, I'm a big believer in what GO can bring to Niagara. And post-COVID, where there's going to be more people who... Uh, speaking of the context that the mayor brought up, more people that are our kids' age um, who, could, who maybe will be working two days a week in the GTA. And it's even more important if they want to stay in Niagara that there is that connection. So I'm just wondering, you know, you, talk, you, you mentioned GO briefly in the slide and, and you talked, but I didn't see... Um, and, and perhaps it's because it's a new thing, but I think the post-COVID world is something that small town communities, I think are starting to get their head around, that it makes the um, livability of a small town and the connection to the bigger um, community an even more realistic, but perhaps a more necessary thing going forward. And I didn't know when you're doing the small uh, town Niagara tour, if, if, you know, you may blanket in an economic development, but I think it's a, it's a housing initiative to get people to move here. It's a repatriate initiative. It's a stay here and still work in the bigger community. Um, I think it's a chance for people to have the small town experience in a big way. Um, and so uh, I just threw in a plug that's kind of an inside uh, Thing you might not have picked up on, but stay tuned. Uh, Matt will be in our <laughs> strap plan. Uh, I, I'm just wondering if if you could comment on that, as well as with COVID. Um, whilst we're ramping up, and there's been that drop in transit, has the initiative to bring go and the stations and that construction schedule has it slowed down as well, Matt? Matt? And through you, Mr. Mayor, uh, to Councillor Bruno. So I think there was, GO was in there twice in different nuances. So maybe we'll start with uh, the point around livability. Um, I won't use small town. I grew up there. I didn't consider Port Coburn to be a small town. Um, but I like the idea of, you know, the housing nuances, Councillor, retention of youth, uh, you know, a, a way to live at home and, and uh, sort of stay connected into your, and, and when we say GTHA, that's not just driving into Union Station on a GO train. That could be Burlington, Oakville, uh, Mimico, uh, Port Credit, any of those stops along that continuum. Hamilton, for that matter, uh, which of course is connected around the bend, around the bay into the GO network. So um, we certainly see that the GO stations uh, being established uh, and the service returning when Metrolinx uh, ramps back up its service as being a huge driver, not only of development, but as you as you pointed out, Councillor, uh, of all of that youth retention, livability and, and sort of affordability of being able to live in Niagara and work outside. And whether that's modified work hours, modified work weeks, people can stay connected to those well-paying, high-skilled jobs 
uh, either they've, they've stayed here and, and acquired that in the GTA or they're moving down here and retaining that job they had in the GTA, that spine of provincial high order transit and go will allow us and allow Niagara to really tap into that, that connectivity uh, between our region uh, and everything up along that Lake Shore West line. So you make great points about why it's valued. And I think that goes into the second piece of your question around the timeline. Um, I'm hopeful that in early 2021, there is uh, news out of Metrolinx and the region for that matter uh, on the station development strategy uh, for the multi-site GO stations in Niagara, which should give you the details that you're looking for. And unfortunately, some of that information remains in closed session right now at the province's behest. Uh, but needless to say, the other hat that my team wears is really driving those, those GO stations and their, uh, their construction and renewal here in Niagara. So we're confident that 2021 is going to be a big year in terms of being able to make some significant uh, public uh, advances on the GO stations uh, that, uh, that residents will be able to see sort of tangible uh, uh, realities that you've talked about, making those GO stations connected to our communities. Thank you, Matt. Great presentation. I hope we all support it uh, unanimously. So uh, um, I, actually, you've probably answered my question that I was going to ask in 7.1 in a report later on. But uh, thanks, Matt. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor uh, Bodner. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'm glad you're reminding me how old I am. I was feeling pretty good about 10 minutes ago. But uh, <laughs> anyways, I think we'd be remiss in, uh, in uh, thanking the people that were there right from the get-go when transit was really on the back of a napkin or the back of an envelope or something. And uh, people said, oh, it'll never work. It's too expensive. You'll never get everybody to agree. While we're getting close to that end, I'll pick up on Councillor Bruno's um, comment and everything else he said was great, but uh, um, transit is expensive. There's no doubt about it, but it's good value. It's like healthcare or education or something. It's it'll transform a community. So um, one of the people I think that I can remember around the council table for years, our council table was Councillor Di Bartolomeo, who was always on a transit, always reminding us how much it was needed. And uh, kudos to him for keeping pushing it. But thank you, Matt, for the presentation. Good luck on everything. Um, I, I hope we all see the need for this right across the region. It's uh, it's absolutely a win-win for everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Bodner. Councillor Clayloff. Here you, Mr. Mayor, to Matt. Well, I'm, I'm another proponent. I, for the last four years of my career, spent some weeks, five days a week, trans, uh, commuting to Toronto for my position there. And um, a lot of it was on transit. And I went sometimes from a bus to the train. And if I could have had a GO train right from St. Catharines or somewhere closer than having to get to, to Hamilton or Burlington to get on that GO train, it, it was it was much better way. It was a lot of time spent on the bus but at, and the train, but at the same time, it was much easier than trying to commute back and forth with your car. And, and it was busy then. So I can just imagine how busy we will be if we can pull all of this together. Um, Niagara really needs it, and it gives people the opportunity to live here and be able to go in and work from home, which more and more people are doing. And even... Even I, myself, towards the end of my four years I was doing it, I was working from home, so I know it's possible. So good work, keep it up, and I support it 100%. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Clayloff. Any further questions to the presentation? Perfect. So, Matt, if you and your uh, um, team can stay on, because I am going to bring up our report this evening, just in case we need um, any clarification from your end on it. Um, do. I, do, I do want to give out a shout out to my good friend Eric Gillespie. I haven't seen Eric in a lot of years. Um, Eric is very good friends of uh, a good friend of mine, Tate Hopkins. Eric, good to see you. Thank you for being here. A pleasure to be here, Mr. Mayor. Great to see you. Yes. Also, Councillor Danch and I went to high school together. <laughs> good stuff. See? Big Pork Over connection with this project. Fantastic.
So council, I'm going to have councillors Bruno and Bagu move that Corporate Services Department Report 2021-39 be received. The council endorse in principle the full commission as a recommended, recommended, recommended the governance model for the con consolidation of Niagara's public transit system, taking into account that Niagara Region will commit to an address that the City of Port Colborne service levels set out in the report Transit Enhancement Opportunity Report 2021-15 dated January 11, 2021 are maintained and improved upon. B, that the proposed financial model uh, be amended to address concerns presented by the City of Port Colborne and C, the Region uh, Council consider geographical areas such as Niagara South when selecting two additional councillors for the full commission. And the Council direct the, uh, the Director of Corporate Services treasurer and the chief administrative officer to continue to work with other municipal CIOs and regional staff on the regional financial structure of the consolidation of Niagara's public transit system which will be presented to council with a targeted time frame of second quarter of 2021. Questions to the report? I'm not seeing any. Uh, one Matt is, is something that's, that came through to my office to me at um, municipalities being able to purchase uh, services somewhat how we do um, waste management now where our, our you know Port Coburn can can uh, increase their um, Okay, next our delegation this evening under item 10.1 is Mike Chechok. Um, he will be speaking with regards to Farm 911. Uh, Mike, welcome. Yes, good evening. Yeah, uh, can you, can I hope you, I said your can last you name me? correctly. Yes, we can hear you. Okay, thank you. Do you want to proceed through your presentation? Yes, I can. Good. Go ahead. Um, were you going to run this uh, video first? Uh, yes, our staff will do that. Losing Emily True is a community tragedy, but from that tragedy has come a very positive outcome, and that is the legacy of the Farm 911 project. It will give dispatchers much more accurate geographic information as to where the emergency is, and that in turn will give the responders much better information on how to get to the person that is in need the quickest for life safety events. And, and, and often, unfortunately, in the emergency services, it takes a tragedy for us to realize there's a gap. So on the day of the accident, uh, I made the 911 call. When I got talking to the dispatcher, the first thing she asked me for is a 911 number. I was unable to provide her with one, being there wasn't one in that field. She asked for the closest 911 number, which I'm not able to provide her with because I wasn't leaving Emily at the time. If there's one thing I learned from the accident is the importance of a 911 number on your property to be able to tell people where you are. The importance of it is, is life or death. You can't put a value on those crucial minutes that you need to be able to get help. The challenge is that um, the GIS system is address based in all the dispatch systems. So we really need an address, and that's usually the first question a dispatch will ask you, is what's your address, what's your emergency, and what's your name, what's your number? Those are the four critical questions we need to have answered. And, and the challenge with the, with the 911 access or the farm, the farm field uh, challenges or the, or the back lot challenges, the hunting camp challenges, as, as Mark has talked to, is that, that that may not be the most accurate information we have. And that's what the Emily project identified was was the next gap in 911. And if we can get that address information, 
into the first responders hands more quickly they're going to get to the scene more quickly luckily the ambulance we were able to see them going by and i was able to get a hold of someone to send them back to us because we were you know running out of time all it takes is one municipality i believe to see the importance of this project and the safety of it it'll be infectious and other ones will follow i think it's something the public is going to want and need and it's important that we make it a mandatory service within these municipalities. Right now I'm standing in front of the Emily Trudeau splash pad, which the community has really rallied and pulled together to make this project happen. The splash pad is the first part of Emily's legacy. The Farm 911 project is the next. When you make that call and they're not there, I don't want anyone else to have to feel the way I felt that day. Uh, Emily was 100% farm girl. We used to call her farm girl strong because that's her attitude. That's the way she was. Her outlook on life was just amazing. She was just an infectious person that if she was around you, you'd obviously bring you a lot of joy. She was the type of person that if you met her once, you remembered her. For her to have her name on a project like this, knowing that she's still helping people is worth a lot. Okay, thank you. Mike, I'd also just like to recognize um, your associate director, Rob Cosby. He's also in line with us. Good night. Good night. And anything else? Did you want to, do you have any more? Does anybody need a bathroom break? Oh, well, that's not us. I would okay. appreciate one. See you in a few minutes. Thank you. <laughs> I think somebody's tapped into our line. Uh, are you gentlemen all tuned into my voice right now? Nobody yes, can Yes, Ms. Montgomery, just remember that everything is streaming, so. Yeah, that's all right. I'm, okay. I'm not saying any bad words. <laughs> no, I mean uh, as far as discussing items that are not, well, we're not another, in public that's, session. That's another right. idea. No, I, I was just going to say, I do remember that it became written in concrete. I do have, I do have a brief uh, write-up that I'd like to present. Certainly, go ahead. Okay. Good evening, Mayor Steele, City Councilors, and City Staff. Thank you for the opportunity to present the uh, Farm 911 the Emily Project to you this evening. Uh, as you said, my name is Mike Chichak, and I'm a member of the Safety Committee of the Niagara Federation of Agriculture. And I'm joined, as you've said, by Rob Cosby, our Associate Director. The Niagara Federation of Agriculture represents approximately 1,400 farm families, <clears throat> farm members in Niagara. We are requesting that the city of Port Coburn participate in the Farm 911, the Emily Project, to allow safety conscious farmers in Port Coburn to have the ability to have 911 signs erected at farm field entrances to aid first responders in their event of a farm field emergency. This project was become this project has become a provincial wide initiative over the past couple of years, assisted by local federations of agriculture in most areas. This project was started locally in 2018 by the Niagara South Federation of Agriculture. The town of Pelham and the township of Waynefleet became involved and the first signs were erected in the fall of 2019. In early 2020, Niagara North and Niagara South amalgamation and COVID resulted in a brief pause in this project. We are now actively moving forward with this project with all the remaining municipalities in Niagara region. At the same time, we are asking for the interested farmers in Pelham and Waynefleet to consider the applying for the signs in their areas. 
This is also being aided by a generous financial contribution by Clark Agri-Services in Wellenport to help offset the cost of the first signs in those municipalities. We are looking forward to being able to have farmers request these Farm 911 signs in all Niagara municipalities. Thank you for your time this evening, and we look forward to the opportunity to have the City of Port Coburn involved in the Farm 911, the Emily Project. I will take any questions at this time. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Uh, uh, great presentation. Council, any questions to Mike on this? Councillor Bodner. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you to Mike. Mike, uh, it sounds like this is a voluntary um, voluntary on on the farmers. Is was there not some talk in the video of it being uh, mandatory? Do you have any thoughts on Mike? It, it's 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 it is a, a voluntary uh, position by the landowner to have a. 911 sign put at the uh, farm entrance or the property entrance. So um, no one has made it mandatory in their municipality so far. Okay. They, they've passed bylaws to make it so that uh, uh, the farm owner or the landowner uh, can have these signs put up um, at their entrances. Councilor Bodner? Take your mute off. Mr. Mayor, through you to any uh, staff that can help me out here, when we put the 911 signs up for households in port, um, you didn't have to pay for that. That was done through the municipality, am I correct? How did that work? Uh, Deputy Chief Lawson. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, to uh, Councillor Bodner, I believe that's all part of their building permit process. I think there's a hundred dollar fee that's that's somewhere in that application. Um, I know the fire department installs, and we there is no fee that we collect for that service. Okay, thank you. Okay, you're all set, Councillor. Yeah, just one further thing. I don't think this is the easiest project to support that's ever come before Council. I think. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Demeray. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, through you to the presenter, first of all, let me say thank you for, for getting on this and staying with it. I think it, it is so very, very important. Um, and I would agree with Councillor Bodner that uh, I, I can't even imagine a reason not to support this. But I would like to see that the city uh, maybe get a hold of this and take it a little bit farther. Uh, possibly we could make it mandatory. Possibly we could find a way to help fund. I'm not sure what we could do, but I would like to take it to staff and see what could happen because I, I think this is essential. I can't even imagine going forward without having this in place. So I, I would like to refer to take send that to staff and, and see what they can come back to with. Councilor, can I, I'll come back to you on that uh, because okay. I, I actually have that written down, but if we can do questions first and then we mm -hmm. can uh, put a motion to staff for direction. Is that fine? Okay. I'll come yep, back perfect. to you. Councillor Bruno. Thank you, Worship. I was going to reiterate what um, um, Councillor Demeray had just. I'm wondering, um, through you to the presenters, um, would there be any way for you to um, uh, quantify um, the number of these entrances that would require a sign? Because I, I, re I remember to Councillor Bodner's point, that when they were all first put in, when we went to that wayfinding for fire, they, it was a city paid for project. And I know um, now when you get a, a new home in the, in the country, um, it is in your building permit application. And I think Scott was right, it's approximately $100 and it, it gets you that, uh, that sign and that number and that vein. But I, I think the best starting point is to measure or understanding the the breadth of how many um, how many of these either farm gate farm laneways would be required, and perhaps if the presenters could also ask um, in a mandatory situation like we did with rural residential, um, 
they were putting in. Would your association um, prefer that it be mandated or are there going to be members that don't want them? Notwithstanding, even if it was, um, there was no cost. Mike? I, I believe that the uh, members uh, would be in favor of having them put in. Uh, it, it helps with many things. Uh, Rob could probably help me with this, but they, uh, it, it would help them with getting uh, product delivered to the uh, field, uh, machinery delivered to fields, um, um, any a number of different things that uh, the landowner uh, would like to see uh, and make it easier than counting trees or fence posts or uh, whatever going down a roadway uh, to get um, a specific item or machinery delivered to a farm field or an EMS or a fire truck uh, to put out uh, and help out uh, with an emergency at a at a farm field because when you drive down a lot of uh, country roads uh, you may travel for uh, several kilometers and not see a house and not know where you are until you come out uh, till you come up to a uh, a 911 sign and then realize that you may have gone too far or not gone far enough so this would help out immensely uh, in those long uh, back roads where there are no uh, where there are no identification at all thanks mike rob anything to add to that I think Rob's frozen. Councilor Bruno? Yeah, I'm just wondering, Mike, if your group could uh, could come up with a number of, uh, of, of necessary signage in the Port Co in, inside of Port Coburn um, on farmland. Or would you want to hazard a, an estimate at this point? Mike? Well, I'm not, uh, I, I'd, I'd hate to have, I'd hate to hazard a, a number of how many actual properties there are that would need a, a, the 911 signs. Um, because a, a field can be anywhere from an acre to several hundred acres. Uh, and, that, and that could be, uh, and it depends on where the landowner or farmer um, or city staff or whoever um, uh, want the sign installed for ease of access or uh, what they normally use as an in out. So to start establishing how many there are uh, would be very difficult unless we went out, unless you went out and uh, started uh, so soliciting with every farmer and landowner uh, in Port Coburn, the city of Port Coburn to find out uh, how many fields there are. Councillor? Yes, just one last thing. I'm wondering, though, there's got to be a balance between the safety concern. It would be nice to have a sign at every culvert that leads into a field. And I don't know if your organization or the Emily Project has looked at that because I, I take on board the main point of the project in the emergency service. I, I guess we would look to the farm community to talk about what is essential and what would be great to have. So I don't know if you guys have crossed that bridge anywhere. Mike? Uh, in, um, in other municipalities and in uh, Wayne Fleet and in uh, Pelham, they have identified only one entrance, one key entrance. So whether it's on a paved road or a non mud road, which is only seasonal, they've, they've identified uh, one main entrance into a field uh, and uh, so that uh, they have good access uh, for entrance with any type any size uh, any any anything uh, going into that piece of uh, that section of land i hope that answers your question uh, councillor thank you mr mayor thank you mike i guess um i Councillor Demery and Bodner, I think, summed it up with uh, coming back with a staff report. I'm not sure of the parameters of that and whether the combination of fire and, uh, and operations. But, uh, yeah, I would be in favor of hearing more on that, how it directly impacts Port Coburn, and if it's something feasible 
um, for fire uh, to incorporate and there may be reasons that we're unaware of um, that would be great to have in that report. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Councillor. Any further questions from Council? Seeing none, if I can go back and have Councillors Demeray and Bodner move that we ask for a staff report from uh, Deputy Chief Scott Lawson regarding the Farm 911, the Emily Project. Um, I'll have uh, any questions on that or, or any questions to staff now that we have a motion on the floor. Councillor Demeray or Councillor Bodner, did you have anything to add? Nothing? Okay. Um, Deputy Chief Lawson, anything to add? No, we'd be happy, more than happy to take this project on and we will consult with the building and, and planning departments to get this done. Okay, Councillor Bodner. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Can I make the suggestion, it was probably already there by Scott, but that you contact Mike um, and just get their thoughts on it. I don't know if there's ever a reason not to have a sign on a piece of property for some reason, but just so we get it right the first time. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, and I, my understanding is that, that the fire department along with our other staff will work with uh, uh, Mike's group um, on this and anything they need from them or clarifications or best practices moving forward. So um, I think Scott has all that on in a good handle. Scott, we can <laughs> assume that for now. You're all set to move on this. Mr. Mayor, uh, no problems. We've already been talking to a couple other municipalities about this before this presentation. Great, thank you, uh, Scott. Any further questions on this motion? Seeing none, all in favor, raise your hand. Opposed? That's carried. Mike and uh, Rob, thank you very much for your presentation and we look forward to you working with our uh, with our staff here at the City of Port Comer. Thank you for the opportunity to present this to you tonight. Great, thank you. Thank you. Okay, Council, I'll move into the Mayor's report. Just before I get into this, uh, Regional Councilor Butters will not be with us this evening. So if you do have any questions for Councilor Butters, just put them through at the end of my report, if there are any. Um, as everyone is aware, we are currently in the lockdown stage of the province of Ontario's response framework in dealing with COVID-19. The message has been clear, stay home. This week, as case numbers have started dropping and children have returned to school, we anticipate changes to the current restrictions in Niagara as of February the 16th. Exactly what level Niagara will be at will be determined by the province as we get closer to the state. We continue to emphasize the need for social distancing, hand washing and face coverings where social distancing can't be maintained or where required by the region's face covering bylaw. And we ask that you continue to support our local businesses through these tough lockdown times. We are also in discussion with the region and other municipalities on a coordinated show of respect for those who have lost their lives due to COVID-19. I hope plans will be finalized by our next meeting and I will speak about them at that time. February marks Black History Month, a time when we celebrate, celebrate black culture and recognize the many accomplishments and contributions made in Niagara, in our province and across our country by those in our black community. I'd like to tell you a story about the role Port Colburn played for the freedom of many. They were hidden in plain sight on the ships coming into uh, the guard lock at Port Colburn. Escaping their enslaved conditions, helpers had guided them along the Underground Railroad, direct them to ports like Erie and Sandusky along the American shore of Lake Erie. Among the owners and captains of the vessels on the lakes were ab ab abolitionists. Determined to help blacks escape slavery, sometimes they hid the fugitives on board, but a less suspicious method was simply to add them as the ship's crew. Using fake names, the fugitives could board the ship openly and just had to act their part as crew members as the ships left American shores 
heading towards Canada. Recent research has focused on the schooner Home and its abolitionist captain, James Nugent, who assisted many to freedom in Canada. Nugent brought the Home into the Welland Canal on many trips, and it was here in Port Colborne at the guard lock of the second Welland Canal where some of the blacks escaping slavery got off their ships and stepped into life as free people, while others stayed on board until the ship reached St. Catharines. Although their lives were not easy, with racism and prejudice still formidable barriers, they were free. We each have a part to play in eradicating racism. In September of last year, we signed into the Coalition of Inclusive Municipalities, reflecting our commitment to work towards policies that eradicate racism and discrimination and promote human rights and diversity. While we have made progress as a community, uh, much more work needs to be done. Heritage Week 2021 also takes place from February the 15th to the 22nd. This year's theme is exploring our past and reimagining our future. Heritage is all around us. It is in the stories you hear from your family and friends, the places you visit, the buildings you see in your community, the books you read, the films you watch, the cultural activities you experience, the landscapes you love to explore, and so much more. During Heritage Week, the Port Coburn Historical and Marine Museum encourages everyone to visit the L.R. Wilson Heritage Research page and discover our great buildings, extraordinary landscapes, and vib vibrant industrial and rural communities, or to watch the virtual tours of the museum exhibit, A Village by the Canal. A series of videos on YouTube launching Heritage Week. If you can't experience activities and places online, then consider exploring Heritage Village by strolling through the museum grounds and Welland Canal Trail where exhibit panels are available to read. Our fire department is challenging all kids in Port Colburn to build them a fire truck. The goal is to build a fire truck with any items you have around the house. It could include an egg carton, milk carton, tissue box, construction paper, or a shoe box. We ask that you take a photo and send it to fpo at portcolburn.ca. That's fpo at portcolburn.ca. Be sure to include, include your contact information, your name, grade and age of student, contact information, name of school, parents' email contact, and your photos must be submitted by Monday, February the 22nd at 5 p.m. Our customer service representatives have been receiving calls from homeowners experiencing frozen pipes during this current cold snap. If the pipes in your home have frozen, you can attempt to thaw these pipes yourself following these steps. Turn on a tap in the basement. If you are successful in thawing your pipes, water will begin flowing from this tap. Locate the sh water shutoff valve in your home. If the pipe you are attempting to thaw bursts or you are successful in thawing the pipe, it may leak and potentially cause a flood. In this case, you will need to shut off the water to your house using the water shutoff valve until the leaky pipe is fixed. Use a blow dryer or space heater on the exposed pipe near the water meter for one or two hours, or you can try placing a warm towel or rag around the pipe. Do not use a torch with an open flame. This could set your house on fire. Being in the insurance business, I've seen many of those. If you have completed these steps and still don't have water, under the city's frozen water service, contact a plumber to come to your home. The plumber should confirm that your internal plumbing is not frozen and attempt to thaw your service line from inside the building. For more information, please see our city website. And remember, Wart Willie said spring is just around the corner. The city, is, uh, the city of Port Coburn is inviting residents to participate in this year's virtual polar plunge in support of Special Olympics Ontario. This will be the second time the city has participated in the signature fundraising event with participants braving the cold and jumping in Lake Erie at Sugarloaf Marina last year. With current COVID-19 restrictions in place, the event will be completely virtual, asking participants to take the plunge safely in the comfort of their own home. I know it's different from last year's polar plunge, but I think people can be very creative. You could fill your bathtub with ice cubes, make a snow angel in your bathing suit, run through a cold sprinkler. There are so many possibilities. 
Last year, more than 560000 was raised across Ontario, with Port Coburn raising approximately $12,000. This year, we hope the community uh, can hit the 5000 mark. Because of COVID, we don't, we don't know how the participation will be. Uh, if we can break the 12000 mark, that would be fantastic also. And we look forward to seeing residents get involved virtually. Individuals are asked to participate in the following ways. Register for the plunge by visiting www.polarplunge.ca. Residents are encouraged to join the Port Colburn team. Plunge any time between the 1st of February and the 28th of February from the comfort of your own home. Uh, and if you can go to http colon backslash backslash polarplunge.ca backslash ways slash or uh, dash to dash plunge, uh, you can... Uh, um, donate through that. Uh, fundraise and receive amazing prizes and incentives while helping support over 26,000 Special Olympics athletes across the province. Post your plunge vid video on social media using the hashtag, hashtag plunge on and hashtag participate. Be sure to tag the city of Port Coburn in your post for a chance to be featured on social media or send your video to event services at portcoburn.ca. Participants are encouraged to be creative and have fun. However, safety is very important as you participate in the virtual polar plunge. And like last year, Council, my wife and I will be doing the polar plunge. So I know some of you donated to us last year. Uh, both Deb and I ask that you uh, uh, go on the system and, and, and look to make a donation again. And uh, we're uh, coming up with some uh, really good ideas with our kids to... Uh, uh, make the plunge very worthwhile for my wife and I. And to everyone out there that donated to our cause last year, please uh, get on board again this year. We look forward to raising as much money for this great cause as possible. And in closing, we will be, continue to work together and remain vigilant in fighting the COVID-19 virus. Our number one priority is the health and safety of our staff and our citizens. So we ask you, please stay safe and be kind. Council, any questions with regards to the mayor's report or any questions for the regional councillor? Seeing none, thank you. Oh, sorry, I apologize. I do have one more thing. Um, we, start, we are still receiving some calls about grocery delivery. Uh, Community Support Services of Niagara, uh, better known as CSSN, uh, their staff assist with online grocery orders for seniors and adults with disabilities. Volunteers provide contactless delivery to your door. Orders can be placed with select grocery stores in your area. And in our area, we have Sobeys, No Frills, and Bodner's Market in Gasline. Uh, contactless delivery to your front door by a caring volunteer. Payment options are available. There are no delivery charges. For more information, please call the CSSN at 905-682-682. 3800 extension 706 and that serves the entire Niagara region and uh, they do thank their funders the United Way, Ontario Community Support Association and HNHB uh, Lynn. There you go thank you for that council. And we'll go to staff remarks. Uh, staff, uh, in here first, uh, the CAO, Mr. Louis. Uh, <clears throat> through your worship to council, there was uh, some discussion at the last council meeting about sidewalk construction contract being awarded or extended for a period of time with the current provider, and that decision was approved. But while discussing that item, there was some discussion about sidewalks on Clarence Street um, from uh, in the Westwood area of Clarence Street and I think it was said at that council meeting that that construction was not planned to take place I just want to announce to council and the public that that is planned to take place staff are currently working on a report it will be back in a few weeks I think we talked about it that night having a staff report um, with construction planned for later this year and 
um, plans for some communication with the public and making sure that the public is well aware of the city's plans to undertake that construction. So it is planned for 2021. Thank you, Mr. Louie. Uh, any other staff have anything for council? I don't see any. I'm going to go to councillor's questions. I'm going to start the way I see you on my screen. I'll start with councillor Wells. Thank you, your, your mayor. Uh, I have two items. Uh, the first item is in regards to um, fen or signs that we have seen at the end of Hollow Bay Road uh, from Fort Erie that have established them there, identified as the um, uh, the late lake front uh, windows. I was uh, wondering if uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Louie has received any information from uh, Fort Erie with regards to their intentions or if there's been any plans to work with Fort Erie in regards to development of that end of the road. Mr. Louie. Yes, through your worship to Councillor Wells, I did hear about these signs from uh, ward councillors uh, at the end of last week. I did reach out to the CAO of the town of Fort Erie. So from the image that I saw, this sign looks like a typical sign that would talk about um, access to the lake, respecting private property, garbage, parking, and so on. I think uh, the city, Port Colborne, has had signs of this type in the past about undertow or things like that. Fort Erie uses the term... Uh, I think you just said it, waterfront windows or lakefront windows for their road allowances. We use the term road allowances. Um, so th those signs did go up on what is a shared road. That road is shared between the two municipalities. Um, I'm not sure if staff from engineering are prepared to talk about who takes responsibility for what sections of the road, because sometimes it's divided along the length of the road where each municipality will take responsibility for maintenance, construction, and so on. They, the, the town of Fort Erie, has had their own waterfront strategy, which is sort of like the road allowance study that we're undertaking right now. And they have identified that area for public access, as it is a road allowance, and doing some improvements to the area in 2028, if I recall from my email from that CAO. Uh, I'm just going to make another note here. 2028 they have funding to improve the access now I can't say what improve the access means I don't think it's parking I think it's pedestrian access um, but I can continue to work with the town of Fort Erie to sort of decrypt what that means exactly for Port Colborne residents Councillor Wells thank you mayor um, thanks Scott that's uh, that's what I wanted to hear thank you the, the other item I have is um, with our, our reorganization, probably best addressed by either um, Chief Cartwright, I, I would believe, and maybe Dan will have some um, input on this as well. Uh, but through you, uh, Mr. Mayor, to uh, uh, Chief Cartwright, uh, there has been a recent uh, recognition of a number of medical marijuana grow ops uh, as being established in Ward 4. I was wondering if you might be able to comment in regards to what uh, uh, we can do to manage that development to, to ensure that they're being uh, built properly, that they're being located in areas and any um, offsite effects from the operations uh, could be mitigated through either um, bylaws or other, um, other opportunities uh, that the city may be able to put in place. Thank you, Councilor. I'm going to go to Chief Cartwright first, and then I'll go to Mr. Aquilina second. Chief? Uh, Your Worship, uh, if I could, I'd like to, to go to Dan first, because he can speak to it from a planning and uh, zoning perspective, and I can deal with what we have been able to determine during the course of today. Okay, thank you. Mr. Aquilina? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you to all of Council, is that presently, right now, the City actually has in their zoning bylaw a use of a cannabis production facility there are certain provisions that need to be put in place in order to have that use considered to be a permitted use. One of the requirements is a site plan control agreement between the municipality and the landowner. So 
there are no medical cannabis production facilities or cannabis production facilities that have been approved by the municipality. So, so Dan, on these, on the medical ones, because they're under Health Canada, which does limit um, a lot of things with regards to both the city and the Niagara Regional Police Force, um, can you talk about the Health Canada licenses as opposed to the normal um, for sale marijuana facilities, particularly we see most of them are in Pelham in that area, and there's one in Niagara Lake, I believe. Um, uh, and where where can we start and stop on the Health Canada licensed facilities? Okay, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Right now in the definition we have, whether it's for recreational use or medical use, it is still a cannabis production facility. As council is aware, we had a, a report that was brought forward that accompanied the letter that the NRP had said to Health Canada. And we locally have the same concerns is that Health Canada doesn't do a very good job of communicating with the municipality. We still have control though, however, through our local zoning bylaw dealing with land use. So that is what we have right now, Mr. Mayor. Okay, Councillor Wells. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, just a further question to Dan then on this one is that how effective and how quickly can we act in regards to uh, controlling these through the Planning Act? Mr. Aquilina. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you to Councillor Wells, because our zoning bylaw has a use, we define it, we have regulations. If a property is actually in operation of a use that is not in compliance, our avenue is to do enforcement through the zoning bylaw and the Planning Act. Councillor Wells. Thank you. Okay, Chief Cartwright. Yes, your, your Worship, thank you. So, as Councillor Wells is aware of, and maybe some other members of the Council, in particular Councillor Bodner, I'm sure is, um, I was made aware of the situation on Saturday and a follow-up number of emails over the course of Sunday. Uh, I did go to the property today at 8 o'clock this morning. There was nobody present. I went back uh, mid-morning with the deputy and myself, and there were people there. Uh, we did walk into the building. Um, and there is work taking place within the building, had a discussion with them. Um, we left, came back to uh, the fire hall, uh, contacted uh, the build, chief building official. Uh, the chief building official and myself went out uh, and had a, uh, a look at the facility a little more in depth. Um, in between those two meetings, we had a, um, uh, a virtual meeting with bylaws uh, planning, which was uh, Dave, myself, and we had a, a fairly lengthy discussion about this particular property as well as others that may be in the process of being developed or potentially developed in the municipality. Uh, I, I can tell you that going along with what Dan said, the, the, uh, the planning zoning bylaw does have some teeth in it with regards to uh, uh, what can and can't be done. Uh, in this particular instance, uh, there may be some issues and I'm gonna speak, to, I didn't get a chance to speak to Dan this afternoon, but I will be speaking with him tomorrow morning. And there's gonna be other meetings that take place uh, as quickly as possible. There are some issues. I, I really can't express exactly what they are at this particular time, because there is some limitations as to how we can, what we can say publicly. But the reality of the situation is I can tell you right now that whatever tools are available to us in our toolbox, we will ensure uh, to enact whatever we have to as quickly as possible. Uh, my goal in, in my new role is to become proactive, similar to what we did in fire safety in the community, and, and wherever possible, try to uh, deal with things quickly as possible and take whatever action is necessary. And that's gonna be in, in this particular case in cooperation with Dan and his people with regards to the enforcement tools that we, we have available to us. The fire, because it's considered agriculture, that's another whole thing that comes into play simply because uh, 
as Dan alluded to and the mayor alluded to, Health Canada has put us in a position where they issue licenses. Uh, don't consult municipalities. And this isn't new. I know there's several members of council sitting here right now that have had and been involved in these discussions over the last six, eight years, whatever the case might be. And we really have been struggling as to what we can do uh, and how quickly we can do things. But our my goal, and I believe it, it's all of our goal within the corporation, is to try to deal with them as quickly as possible. But uh, once, once it becomes agriculture, which it is, quite frankly, the fire code isn't applicable to agricultural issues. So we're stuck with whatever rules we can invoke and or whatever's available to us through the Planning Act. Uh, I think that's the simplest way to put it at this time, but it's on my radar. We have been taking a very active role in it today. And I can all I can tell you is that I will continue to do so and we will make sure that we get it as, if it is, whatever happens in these properties, we'll make sure they meet the requirements of whatever laws are available to us. Thank you, Chief. Councillor Wells. Uh, thank you, Chief Cartwright. It, it's good to hear that uh, you're right up on top of this and, and I really appreciate your fast action on on getting to the bottom of what's happening there and, and taking uh, the uh, best interest of the local community on that. Thank you, Chief. Great, thank you, Councillor. And if uh, Chief, you, both you and Dan can keep Council up to date on this as we move forward, uh, please uh, keep sending us emails um, that might uh, produce any questions from us. So if you'd be uh, By all means, Your Worship, obviously we'll be dealing with it from my deputy and myself and uh, uh, bylaws as well as planning and certainly we'll be keeping the CAO fully abreast of what's happening and I'll rely on him on him to communicate to council as to what's going on. Thank you chief. Uh, Councillor Demery. Thank you Mr. Mayor. Uh, I just have one item this evening and it um, it actually is uh, for the clerk so through you to the clerk. Um, it's about the electoral matters committee. I know that that was the, that was to be struck in COVID hit and there was uh, certainly a problem getting that off the ground, but we are against a pretty tough timeline where any findings of that committee would have to be submitted by the end of this year in order to apply to the next council. So um, I would like to know if we can't get a committee up and running, uh, give them some really tight timelines, some specific tasks, and at least have a report coming back to council as quickly as possible. Um, I just wait to hear what you have to say on that. Madam Clerk. Um, yes, I've been disappointed with the pandemic to be unable to really run with this committee and get the insight and opinion from the public in a substantial way. I am planning on bringing a report back to council um, in March of the latest um, with recommendations going forward on uh, what portions of the committee we can still uh, do before the election and again how to move forward with this in a timely manner um, after the pandemic is um, over. Councillor? Okay, I, I do thank you and I appreciate the difficulties on this, but uh, I think it's it, it's really quite urgent. This is something that we're really behind on and we've been talking about this for several years, uh, actually probably every year since the last committee, which I believe was 10 years ago, uh, maybe 11. So uh, it, it really is overdue. So if we can get something done, um, just a, a very quick look at it. Uh, Citizens Committee can meet by Zoom. There's no reason not to be able to do it. So. Uh, I, like I say, I do appreciate your, your attention to this and hopefully we'll hear from it soon. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Clayla. Through you, Mr. Mayor, I've just got a couple of the good news stories. Um, first of all, I just wanted to let everyone know that um, the Friends of Roseon are running their art auction. So if you're looking for something for your uh, Valentine, they have lovely things that are available for auction and they all you have to do is go on the Friends of Roseon or you can go on their Facebook page. You can vi visit with all of the pieces that are there. The auction runs until February the 13th at noon hour and then they'll let the successful people know whoever's won the pieces. There's lovely artwork, there's jewelry, crafts, all kinds of things that, that are well worth a look. Um, I see Councillor Butters has been on there. Anyway, <laughs> There, there are things that you could all have a look at, and I'd like to get the word out so that everyone takes a look and, and helps to support Roseon with this auction. And secondly, um, this is also something uh, since the last meeting that we had, uh, the BIA has, um, downtown BIA has struck um, a new chairperson. We've, they elected Jesse Bowles, who's become the new chair of the downtown BIA. 
And I'm happy to say that he's been working very hard. I had a meeting with him at the end of the last week. Some wonderful ideas, some great partnerships they're working at creating with the city. I know that um, our, our deputy has been working with them. Um, thank you, Amber, very much. He speaks very highly of everything that you've been recommending so far. I know that you were involved with the last meeting. I want to thank you for that. And um, they've got some great ideas and plans and things to move ahead as we work our way out of this pandemic and moving forward. And that's it. Great. Thank you, Councillor. Yeah. Councillor Baggy. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Uh, just one item, uh, probably for Madam Clerk. Um, watching TV last week and starting this week, uh, the Prime Minister talking about the vaccines coming or not coming or maybe coming or delayed or whatever, whatever it's going to be. I went on the Niagara Region Public Health website today and looking at what their rollout is going to be for uh, mass, mass, mass vaccinations. And uh, for phase two, they're talking March to July, depending on availability, of course. And the older adults and high risk uh, people will be getting vaccinated. I'm just wondering, is the city of Port Corbin working with Niagara Region Health to institute a, I guess a mass vaccination? I'm not talking a couple little drug stores where you gotta stand in line or on a corner and that, but actually an area where people can roll up and uh, get vaccinated. Like I hate to have people have to go to Walland or say actually St. Catharines even for uh, when the time comes, like, are we getting prepared for this mass vaccinations? Madam Clerk? Uh, through the mayor, uh, the simple answer is yes, you will have a large vaccination location in Port Colburn. Uh, the region has been planning this for, um, since well before Christmas. Uh, they plan to have a vaccination location at least one in every municipality. Uh, public health is currently working with uh, the city and as well, we're working with the YMCA uh, to set up a vaccination location at the Valet Health and Wellness Center. Uh, we're planning to be open at the beginning of April. Uh, the site will be set up for several months or as long as it takes uh, to get the city or whoever wants to be in the city vaccinated. Uh, this, you should expect an appointment-based system uh, and more information will be coming from the region and from the city when we have it. Uh, I would expect in March we will start publicizing this in a great deal. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Councillor? Thank you very much, uh, Madam Clerk. And uh, to you, uh, Mr. Mayor, just one uh, thank you to the operations and the fire department for the great work they did in that last windstorm. I saw the chief Cartwright on CHCH. You can see him on there quite a bit, actually, which is a good, he did a good job. And uh, I saw the barricades up and uh, I think the, the residents are getting the idea of you don't cross the barricades. There was a few people that went across, but I think we're uh, doing a great job, Mr. Mayor. Just want to say thank you to operations in the fire department. Thank you, Councillor. I'm sure uh, the CAO and Chief Cartwright will pass it along to their staffs. Councillor Danch, anything this evening? You're all set. Councillor Bodner? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, just kind of a public service announcement to the people that uh, walk by Centennial Park at Cedar Bay. Um, Touch base with staff today. Uh, Harry and I have been keeping an eye on the a little bit of construction that was done there uh, for the lawn and the control water. Uh, staff have told me that they'll be on it very early in the spring so that uh, when everyone is ready to head to the beach, uh, that won't be a problem with mud or anything else. So, and the other thing I just like to pick up on and if you hear beeping it's just the blood pressure cuff i got on because every time we talk about this marijuana situation i got to have my blood pressure checked because i don't get upset about too many things but that's something that upsets me mr mayor through you to uh, either the chief or dan when we're looking at uh people that are thinking of building new uh, facilities. Are we also then looking at the ones that we have currently uh, in operation? Um, one at least that is not on agricultural property, just to make sure that um, they're in compliance with um, 
with everything that uh, we're looking at? Uh, I'll start with Dan on that one, or Chief. Chief, you want to start with that one? Sure, I'll take a shot at it, uh, Your Worship. Uh, all I can tell you is once they get in operation, uh, and um, depending on what the situation is with regards to the, the property, if, if we can deal with it, we do, and as best we can, we do. But as far as enforcement of quantities, that falls to the Niagara Regional Police, or I would envision possibly RCMP, but in all likelihood, RCMP. Uh, we don't get involved with that any way, shape, or form. That's a police issue. Um, and, and quite frankly, as far as properties go, we need to know about them. We'll try to deal with them with the tools we have. But quite frankly, as I said earlier, we have limited ability to deal with it. New con a new construction is a little bit different, and Dan can speak to this, I'm sure, more than what I <coughs> But I would think building uh, uh, requirements would be have to come into place with regards to construction, setbacks, uh, planning, zoning, all those things would come into play, site controls and so on on a new construction where we're finding are the ones that are being converted. Those are the ones that are sometimes difficult because in a lot of cases they're, they're in the agricultural environment and that ties our hands somewhat. Dan? Mr. Aquilina. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you to all of council. Certainly once we are aware of anyone wanting to actually establish a facility, we let them know that A, you need to comply with the zoning bylaw. We walk them through what the requirements actually are and the fact you need your building permit in place. And again, the site plan control agreement, we do that by way of an agreement, legal agreement that is entered into and registered on title. But as of this moment now, I have not received any notification of a facility going through the process to the municipality. Okay, Councillor Bodner. Take your mute off. Councillor, you're muted. There you go. Okay, sorry. Yes, I'll contact uh, the chief and Dan with uh, an address and uh, have them look into it. Thank you. Good. Thank you, Councillor Bodner. Councillor Bruno. Thank you, Worship. Just uh, this week, a thank you to Mr. Long and Mr. Louie on uh, um, on, on setting up our meetings with respect to um, updating um, prior to the next to the council meeting on the strategic plan. Thought it was most uh, helpful and uh, really appreciate going outside the box and doing it that way so it wasn't all piled up at a council meeting. So thank you, Mr. Long. Thank you, Mr. Louie. Thank you, Councillor. That's it for Councillor's items. Items. Uh, requiring separate discussion. We have three. We'll start with item 7.2. I'll have uh, Councillors Bruno and Baggio move this. That Chief Administrative Office Report 2021-37 be received and that the Physician Recruitment guide, Guideline in Appendix A of Chief Administrative Office Report 2021-37 be approved. Questions to staff? Councillor Bruno. Thank you, Worship, either to Mr. Louie or uh, I believe uh, Jill may be online. I, I see her icon there. Um, I did have an opportunity to um, uh, uh, email Jill and, and get some of my questions answered, so that'll abbreviate uh, my questions. Uh, through you to Jill or um, Mr. Louie, uh, I'm very supportive of the uh, of the direction, as always, to recruit more physicians, and and pleased with what's been brought forward. I think Joanne and and um, uh, Chairman Kenny have been in to uh, speak to some of you, and I uh, support the uh, uh, the going forward in a new way. Now that uh, Joanne um, has retired, um, one of my concerns in looking back at the policy was um, protecting the city in lieu of a physician not fulfilling um, the requirements. So if we were to give said physician um, or his um, foe or the clinic um, monies um, as, um, as deemed fit to bring on another physician, 
Do we have anything in those agreements? And it's been a while since I've read one from the last talk. You to jump in. Thank you. Yeah, through your worship to Councillor Bruno, I appreciate the question. Um, I think there's two components there, and I'll try to answer them separately. The one component is the length of service required when we put um, grant money out there or incentive money out there under a contract with a practitioner, with a physician, I should say, family physician. So typically we're looking for five years um, of service in Port Colburn. The second part you asked was about the number of patients, and I think Jill can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, we're fine to do the five-year requirement. It has been done in the past with our doctors. There have been scenarios in other municipalities where some of the money has been returned because a doctor was unable to fulfill all five years, and I think will be protected. It's a little bit less for, um, enforceable, I guess, when it comes to the number of patients and or the, the uh, or, origination of the patients. So we could have a doctor who comes into Port Colborne. They'll take their new patients from Healthcare Connects or from a retiring doctor, and they could be Wayne Fleet, Port Colborne, even Fort Erie and Welland. Um, so we don't really have control over where the patients originate or how many patients they take, but definitely the five years and we can claw that back. So what you see before you is the policy, but you've also made reference in your questions to the contract. So the contract would have wording around that recovery of the incentive. Councillor? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Louis. That answers uh, my question and Jill had answered some today by email. That's all I have. Um, looking forward to uh, uh, Jill uh, and Mr. Louie, and however we uh, parlay that former rollout into uh, getting more physicians, very supportive of the program, um, and good luck in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. I have Councillors Bagu, Kalela, and then Wells. Councillor Bagu. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Uh, just a question to the CEO Louie. I'm looking at the Schedule 1, and um, I don't see anything about nurse practitioners. Um, are they included in this incentive program or is it only family physicians? Is anybody home? Yeah, through your worship <laughs> to Councillor Bagu. Sorry about that. Uh, so this is, we are looking for physician recruitments. There is a shortage of physicians in Port Colborne. We think we're, uh, our population is at a number of about 13. I think the number we have now is uh, around eight or nine. And there are some coming up retirements. So many times a physician will open a practice that includes a nurse practitioner for support, but the incentive that we offer is for the actual family physician. I'm not sure if Jill might have something to add to that. I'll turn it over to her through the mayor. Yep, Jill. Thank you, Scott. Um, just in addition to that, nurse practitioners, uh, they do need to work under a family physician um, in order to be paid. So uh, it would be a partnership with the physician, um, and then the incentive would go directly to the physician. Councillor Bagu? Oh, okay, thank you very much, Mayor. We, I know we do have one for sure, a nurse practitioner. I heard nothing but great news about, uh, about her. So, uh, and also, uh, Last thing, like I, uh, I want to thank uh, the CEO because I see we had the the, uh, the healthcare connects connection on our website where it can go right to uh, people looking for uh, physicians, Mr. Merrick. So thank you very much. Great, thank you, Councillor Baggett. Councillor Clayle. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you to Mr. Louis. I just wanted to say thank you. I actually sit on this committee, and I'm quite passionate about getting physicians and nurse practitioners to, to Port Colborne and I want to welcome Jill. It's so good to see somebody, to have somebody new on board. We've been without, with between COVID and um, with Joanne being off. And so to have someone know that's taking this over, we're really pleased to see it. I think you've done a great job putting this recommendation together. I stand behind it, um, everything that you're doing. I like Councillor Beg, you would love to see nurse practitioners in any way, shape or form that we could get more of them here. I think that with the, um, 
with our community age base, I think the practitioners would be really helpful asset to the doctors, which I'm sure you're well assured, well aware of as well. But um, thank you very much for all your work you've done on this, and it's nice to see this being pulled together. Can't wait to see some new doctors in Port Colborne. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Count. Oh. Yep, go ahead. CIO? Yes, through your worship to Councillor Kalela, if I understand there wasn't a question there, but I do want to jump in if that's okay. Um, a couple of notes on that. I appreciate the sentiment, and I'm sure that Jill does too. But uh, this policy was really completed by Joanne Ferraccioli. Some people have said the name Joanne, and just so everyone knows, that's Joanne Ferraccioli, who was in this position um, at the city through direct employment with the city and through a, a contract with Fort Erie when she was working for Fort Erie. Uh, I made reference in the report to the Health Services Committee. I apologize, that was a misnomer. The committee that Councillor Kalalev sits on and referred to is the Medical Education and Physician Recruitment Committee. So I'm sorry to the members of that com committee because they do give great service to the city, including the chair, longtime chair, B. B. Kenny, former councillor, who had a meeting with the mayor a few weeks ago about this very issue. So without Joanne and B and all the members of the committee, I don't think this report would even be before council today. So I think they deserve the credit. Great, thank you. Thank you, through you Mr. Mayor to Mr. Louie. Thank you, I, I agree. Um, Joanne did a great job. I know this was all in the works as all of this happened with COVID. So like I said, I'm just so happy to finally see it come to fruition. I think that we're moving in the right direction. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. I have Councillor Wells. Councillor Wells, did you have a question? Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I'm having a little bit of in and out with the. Well, I thought uh, you were frozen there for right a now, second. But, yes. And uh, mainly with the audio. Um, I have a just a, a uh, clarification. Either Jill or um, Scott could probably address. So through you to either one of them. Uh, you've identified that there's roughly 9,600 uh, rostered patients in Port Coburn. Does that include? Uh, patients that are rostered in other municipalities? Uh, Jill, do you want to answer that? Yes, I can answer that. Uh, yeah, so through the mayor to uh, Councillor Wells. Um, so the 9,600 patients are actually the number of uh, patients that are rostered to Port Colborne physicians. So they, um, up to 47% of the population um, at a minimum is rostered to those patients. So it, it could include um, those from outside of the, the city, um, but it just shows capacity for uh, bringing on additional patients and that there is clearly not enough to roster the population of Port Colburn. Councillor Wall. Thank you, thank you, Jill. Carrying on from that, do we know how many are rost how many Port Colburn residents are rostered with other doctors outside of Port Colburn? Jill? Um, I have not been able to get that uh, detail from the ministry. Um, we we have just a baseline of how many physician or how many patients are rostered to physicians in um, in each of the municipalities, um, just to get kind of a, to get a capacity uh, snapshot of the region. Councillor, thank you. That answered my question. Great, thank you, Councillor Bodner. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you to uh, Scott um, or Jill, I think Scott might have this. Um, it's not mentioned in the reports we have, but you talk about a contract. Can you confirm that, um, that any equipment that a physician would buy using the money that we give them uh, needs to stay in Port Coburn if they decide to leave? Is that still part of the um, the contract? Scott? Yep. Through your worship to Councillor Bonner, it is true that uh, there, there's two components of this. Um, one that you didn't mention is that they do have to show receipts for the incentive they received to, mm -hmm. to demonstrate that they actually used it for the things that uh, it's intended, which includes uh, medical records, furnishings for offices, medical equipment like you just mentioned, some relocation expenses, computer stuff, and so on. And yes, the fact is that if they choose to depart prior to f fulfilling 
the years of the con contract, they'll be walking away from that equipment and it will become city property. Councilor Bodder. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I think it's important that, that people know that uh, the money that the city is giving uh, to attract physicians is pretty well protected and uh, we'll make sure that I'm on that committee also along with Councilor Claydeff. And um, it's important to know that that money is, is protected. Uh, we get good value for it. And um, there isn't really any loose ends that I could see um, not protected. And also we did have a doctor, Jill can correct me or Scott can, um, we did have a doctor leave and he actually, I believe paid back the money that we had given him because he couldn't commit to the contract. So like I say, it's pretty well protected. Thank you. Great, thank you, Councilor Bodner. Any further questions, Council? All those in favor, please raise their hand. That is carried. And again, Jill, welcome and thank you very much. And we look forward to uh, bringing uh, some new doctors to Port Colborne. And I know there's there's some contacts going on right now. So uh, we'll work very hard with, uh, with yourself and the CAO to uh, make sure we land those doctors. Again, thank you. Great, thank you very much. Item 7.4, Council. I'll have uh, Councillor Clayliff and Councillor Demeray move that Corporate Services Department Report 2021-40 audit planning document be received for information. And Councillor Clayliff, you were the only one so far that's asked for questions. Through you, Ms. Mr. Mayor, to Mr. Bowles. Um, I, I, I'm reading the audit and I'm happy to read it and see what it's all about. I just wondered if you could just give us a quick overview of, of I see the recommendations and the reasons, purpose and everything, but um, you know, some people will say it's a lot of money to spend for an audit, but I look at someone coming in and I think coming from position into this where you're taking on um, everything that's happened in the city, I think it, it's, it's a good place to start so that you have a clean slate and we know what we have and where it is. I'm assuming that's what a lot of this is about just so that we tie up a lot of loose ends and know where we're going and where we need to put our monies. Am I right, or? Mr. Bowles. Uh, through uh, the mayor to council, this audit and this document really outlines how the auditor is gonna tackle the uh, year-end financial statements for the city, how they're gonna take a look at uh, their testing protocols, the timing to which they're going to do it, and how they address risk at the city. Um, from my perspectives as the treasurer, um, I think an audit's very important for the city. One, it helps mm -hmm me as a, as a staff person to actually look at the city and make sure that the protocols and procedures we have in place are appropriate and living up to what we anticipate them to. For you as a governing body, as council, it gives you that assurance and it has a third party look at how we're going about and managing the day-to-day uh, -day operations on the finance side. It also gives that final audited number of where the figures are. And that then transponds, that then goes forward to the council, sorry, from council to um, the public. And hopefully that um, provides that level of comfort for the public to understand that our finances at the city have had an opportunity to be looked at by a third party and they concur with the activities and how we've accounted for the activity of the city. Um, historically, the city has always had a clean audit opinion, and we anticipate we'll have a clean audit opinion this year as well. Um, I think some years this audit plan hasn't always come to council. It's come maybe every two years. Uh, being new to the city, I thought it was important that we would bring this forward at the beginning of the audit. Um, also recognizing that we're moving the audit up this year. We'll have the auditors in here in March. Last year, the auditors weren't in here until August. Uh, so that's going to be a big change. So council is going to get an update on the financial figures of the 2020 year much sooner. In fact, I think I made mention at the last council meeting that I'm going to give council an update in March. Um, it will be the first. It may be the second. I'd love for it to be the first meeting in March, but it may be the second meeting in March where I'll, I'll actually give council an update of what the year end surplus deficit was 
And included in that, I'll have an opportunity to talk about the financial impacts of COVID during the 2020 year, because I know that's a question of council as well. Um, so that's a little bit of summary, a little bit of color around this report. I think, I think the audit process is an important process. And I think Grant Thornton is set up well to uh, give us an opinion early on in the year. And I think hopefully council um, can appreciate all the work that Grant Thornton is going through to get the audit done significantly earlier in the year. Great, thank you, Mr. Bowles. Councilor Clayla. That's all, thank you, Mr. Bowles. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councilor. Any further questions? Seeing none, all in favor, please raise your hand. That's carried. Going on to correspondence item 8.4. This is um, correspondence from the Ontario Stone, Sand and Gravel Association. If I can have Councillors Wells and Clayliff move to receive. Uh, any questions on this one? Councillor Wells. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Um, uh, a question and more so to uh, to complement the, the quarrying activities within the municipality. A lot of times they go sight unseen for their contributions to uh, the community. And I know that they do have to pay a levy that is received by the, the city. And I would just, just uh, would like to um, maybe ask uh, Director Bowles if he could uh, identify the amount that we receive through that uh, levy uh, and uh, where we would typically use that. Mr. Bowles? And through the mayor to council, thank you for the question. Uh, this year, or I'll say it, in 2020, we received a total of $132,000. Um, I actually did a little back checking in 2019. We, were, we received $136,000. Um, and I did a little checking in the past on how it was budgeted. We used to budget it in the operating accounts um, to the city, but these funds really do. And I think the theory of these funds is they're supposed to help um, with the road network of the city because of the activity that's going on. So I guess to go back to um, the audit, when we finalize the audit and we bring forward the year end uh, report on how our financial statements and how our financial activities were, I'm hoping to have that report in March outline this $132,000 and I will be recommending to council that we actually put it into a capital reserve and we would earmark it for the roads budget in future years. When we get to 2020, 2022's budget, I'll look to include it in the budget itself and you'll be able to approve it right in the budget um, going forward. Thank you, Councillor Wells. Thank you, Director Bowles. Uh, I, that's exactly what I was looking for, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Wells. Councillor Clayla, question? That's fine, Mr. Mayor. That was actually one of my questions. Thank okay. you. Okay, thank you, Councillor. Mr. Bowles, just to confirm, both the province and the region of Niagara also receive funding through the formula that's set out by the province with regards to any uh, aggregate uh, sites within any municipality? Uh, that is my understanding. My understanding, it's a, it's a, it's a shared system and we get a percentage of it. Okay, thank you. Just so council knew that, that there actually there's more money than just that comes to Port Clover. Obviously regional and uh, uh, provincial highways and regional roads are included in that. So that's great. Uh, any further questions on that correspondence? And this is to receive. All in favor, please raise your hand. That's carried. There are no motions this evening. Council, does anyone have a notice of motion? Seeing none, we have one set of minutes. I'll have uh, Councillors Demery and Clayliff move the minutes of the Port Coburn Historical Marine Museum Board, November 17th, 2020. Any questions with regards to those minutes? Seeing none, all in favor, please raise your hand. That's carried. Bylaws, we have two uh, bylaws this evening. Bylaws 19.1 and 19.2. I'll have Councillors Baggio and Danch move those. Any questions with regards to the bylaws? Councillor Danch. Councillor 
Sorry about that. I had to click off. I guess uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, to Scott, I see where we have hired a new uh, building inspector. Mr. Lewis? Yeah, through your worship to Councillor Dance, that's a great question. Last meeting I was asked about appointing some inspectors. Uh, we appointed four last meeting. That was uh, Tony Aiello, uh, the two Pelham employees, and the one employee from a private company called RSM. Up until today, I guess, or, or last week, the CBO, uh, so those four were inspectors, the CBO, the chief building official, has been Wayne Fleet's chief building official under a shared service arrangement. Uh, we're finding that there's not enough time to continue the, to share. Uh, that person's busy enough in Wayne Fleet. So one of the four from last meeting, um, Tony Aiello, will be appointed the temporary chief building official here in Port Colborne. The Wayne Fleet gentleman will be repealed. We still have a job recruitment going on. That job was posted not Friday, but a week ago. Uh, so not last Friday, but a week ago last Friday. It's got a few weeks left for people to apply. Please, if you're a CBO, feel free to apply for our job, public service announcement. Uh, we hope to get that closed in uh, probably eight to 12 weeks. Uh, sorry, like the interviews and the offer of employment and everything. Um, so this gentleman is a temporary chief building official until that hiring process is complete. Councillor? Thank you. That's 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 what I want to know. I just he's a temporary at this time. That that's appreciated. Thank you so much. I'm glad we're moving forward. Thank you, Councillor. Any further questions to either bylaw? Seeing none. All in favor, raise your hand. That's carried. Moved by Councillors Bruno, second and Demeray, that Council do now proceed into closed session in order to address the following matters. Twenty point one minutes of the closed session portion of the January 11th, 2021 council meeting and 20.2 chief administrative office report 2021-36 pursuant to the municipal act 2001 subsection 2392C, a proposed or pending acquisition or disposition of land by the municipality or local board uh, surplus lands. Uh, any questions, council? All those in favor, please raise your hand. That's carried. We will now move into closed session. So we welcome those uh, that were watching uh, and we won't be uh, returning to we, the we stream. Okay, thank you. And we'll break for about 10 minutes for staff to set up for this. Thank you, council. Good evening, everyone. <laughs>